So as a church, we are a part of a larger movement, over 6 million worldwide in the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance is a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family existing to try to see people, groups around the world who have not heard the gospel get to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the countries that the Christian and Missionary Alliance has international workers, that is what we call missionaries these days, is Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is in the western part of Africa. Burkina Faso became its own country gaining independence from France in 1960. They've had a number of different conflicts and wars. It's a war-torn place, and it's a place with a lot of animism, where there's a lot of witchcraft and other uh, beliefs. Uh, But the Christian and Missionary Alliance continues to do innovative things to love the people of Burkina Faso and to bring the gospel. One way, I'm going to show a video right now, uh, is the Dorcas House. Dorcas is a name in... In the Bible, it's not just a name that you called your brother growing up. And and this is an amazing ministry to women, so I want you to take a look. The problem global of women in Burkina Faso is surtout the lack of instruction. And the other problem is poverty. Because here, we say to women, who are the most poor of the poor? When we have formed the association, Nous avons demandé au Seigneur, qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire pour ces femmes Qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire pour les aider Et là, le Seigneur nous a donné la vision de faire un centre où nous pouvons former des filles. Donc la vision est venue de former toutes ces filles à un métier et surtout de leur apprendre aussi la parole de Dieu, la formation spirituelle. Dorcas House is a, a center for girls to come who have a wide variety of needs, but I would say they've been marginalized in this society. Maybe they don't have any parents. Some of them have been involved in prostitution, kind of like as a last resort. We have some single moms. Le projet pour le moment, c'est la couture, la broderie que nous pratiquons, la fabrication du savon et donc la teinture, le jardinage et l'élevage. Et donc une journée commence comment? Toujours par la prière. We start at the very beginning. What is the Bible? Why do we believe in the Bible? We start with the women of the Old Testament and work up to Christ, and then through salvation, and then we did a baptism class. And we had 11 girls that asked to be baptized, and it was so genuine. Nous avions vu des caractères, des filles qui avaient un caractère très difficile. Mais nous leur avons appris le pardon, comment vivre dans le groupe. Nous beaucoup ont appris à accepter les autres parce que c'était pas facile. Au début. Life transformation is really what it's all about. Just to see them get a sense of dignity, realizing who they are in Christ, and that they have a Heavenly Father who loves them, and that He has a plan for their life, and that the power of love is stronger than the power of hate. We started getting phone calls and messages coming back saying, this girl is so changed, her life is transformed, and we as a village want to thank you and everyone at Dorcas House. Nous sommes convaincus que sans l'aide de Dieu, nous ne pouvons pas faire un seul pas. Donc nous avons besoin que nous soutiennent par la prière. Ensemble, nous puissions travailler pour le Seigneur d'ici que le Seigneur Jésus-Christ revienne. This is amazing work, but it goes further. I sent an email this last week uh, asking questions of international workers around the world. Have you seen some different things going on in your field? And I got this email back from Esther Schaefer. She's an international worker right there in Burkina Faso. She says, "Uh, I've got this, uh, this story of a mother of one of our students who was blind. Hers was a demonic blindness. My impression is that it began in her youth and she had she was involved in, she got involved in witchcraft and became blind. She attended an evangelism campaign where she heard about Jesus in her village and she went forward. She said to the pastor, I can see people who have already died. But those living, I cannot see. The pastor first prayed for deliverance and then she prayed to receive Christ. She opened her eyes, 
and she looked right at the pastor, and then she began looking around for her family. Her eyes were completely healed. Shortly after, her son accepted Christ and was called into ministry. What we're finding is most of our experience here with blindness is caused by demonic activity and witchcraft. Blessings, Esther. We've been going through the Gospel of John. And last week we saw the definitive miracle that proves that Jesus was the Messiah in John chapter 9. If he did no other miracle, this one would prove that he's the Messiah based on Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 42, which tells us that the one who will come will open blind eyes. No one else had done it. All of those great people in the Old Testament, no accounts of healing of blind eyes. And Jesus does it six times on four occasions. He's just showing off, right? He could have done it once. He does it six times. Eh, you know, maybe he did it more than that. Because we know that John says that if everything that Jesus did was written down, it would fill up all the books in all the world. And so who knows how many blind eyes Jesus opened up. But it's encouraging to me that part of our movement is still seeing blind eyes being opened up. Why? Because of the authority of Jesus Christ. And in John 9, at the end of that passage, Jesus finds the man who had received his sight, kind of introduces himself because he, this man had not seen Jesus before. And Jesus is like a shepherd who's willing to leave the hundred, the ninety-nine, to go find the one. And this man is the one. And this man responds by saying, I want to follow you, Jesus. I believe in you. You are the Lord. Jesus chastises the Pharisees at the end of chapter 9 and says, you, should, you guys should see most clearly that I am who I say that I am because and because you say that you can't see it, then you are blind. And Jesus calls them blind on a number of different occasions, including in Matthew 23, where he calls them blind guides and hypocrites. And they were hypocrites. These Pharisees, this, these religious leaders, were false shepherds. They were bad shepherds. They were the ones that I believe that Ezekiel is uh, prophesying about in Ezekiel 34. If you want an assignment for your quiet time this week, Read Ezekiel 34 and look to see how amazing it is that God, hundreds of years beforehand, is prophesying the things that come to pass about shepherds, about good shepherds, and about not good, so good shepherds. In this case, the Pharisees play the role of the bad shepherds or the false shepherds. And in chapter 10 here, Jesus will tell us another I am statement, another word about himself that he is the good shepherd. And uh, this is all taking place during the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. And um, this is the fourth festival that John um, mentions along the way. Every festival, Jesus shows up and uses it as an opportunity to say, oh, by the way, the things that this festival is pointing toward is me. And he connects the dots for the people. This is not unlike that. Jesus is identifying himself as the good shepherd, and he's identifying himself as God one last time, very clearly declares that he is God. I and the Father are one in this chapter before he kind of, well, ducks out. Every two chapters, Jesus disappears miraculously, mysteriously. They try to arrest him. They try to stone him, and he, like, keeps disappearing into the crowd. I don't know how he did that, but I want to see the movie when I get to heaven. So he ducks out. This is one of the last things that he does publicly, aside from with his own disciples, until that last week of his life. This morning, we're going to look at chapter 10 of John as we're going through this uh, gospel of John. And we're going to see this next I am statement, which of course is that I am the good shepherd. He makes this clear reference to the fact that he's Messiah. As Jesus uses this analogy of the shepherd and the sheep, it points back to the Old Testament. Uh, God tells his people that he's their shepherd and points us forward to expecting that Jesus will also be our shepherd in the future for us. That's his role. And when we think about the good shepherd this morning, we're going to ask as the sheep, as his followers, what do you need the good shepherd to do for you today? And where is the good shepherd leading you? 
So let's look at the whole of the chapter. Then we're going to focus just on the first uh, part of the chapter as we go verse by verse. But I want you to be able to see the, the, the video, and I want you to specifically notice the claims that Jesus is making at the end of the chapter, uh, toward the end of the video, which are very bold, and you can see that it riles everybody up, and everybody understands that Jesus is claiming to be God, the Messiah, come in human form. So let's take a look. Grab your popcorn. Here we go. I am telling you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who goes in through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep hear his voice as he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought them out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow someone else. Instead, they will run away from such a person because they do not know his voice. Jesus told them this parable, but they did not understand what he meant. So Jesus said again, I am telling you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All others who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Those who come in by me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order that you might have life. Life in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd who is willing to die for the sheep. When the hired man, who is not a shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep and runs away. So the wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hired man runs away because he is only a hired man and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. As the father knows me and I know the father, in the same way I know my sheep and they know me. And I am willing to die for them. There are other sheep which belong to me that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them too. They will listen to my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my father has commanded me to do. Again there was division among the people because of these words. He has a demon! He's crazy! Why do you listen to him? A man with a demon could not talk like this. How could a demon give sight to blind people? It was winter, and the festival of the dedication of the temple was being celebrated in Jerusalem. Jesus was walking in Solomon's porch in the temple when the people gathered round him. How long are you going to keep us in suspense? Tell us the plain truth. Are you the Messiah? I have already told you, but you would not believe me. The deeds I do by my father's authority speak on my behalf. you will not believe, for you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never die. No one can snatch them away from me. What my Father has given me is greater than everything, and no one can snatch them away from the Father's care. The Father and I are one. And the people again picked up stones to throw at him. I have done many good deeds in your presence, which the Father gave me to do. For which one of these do you want to stone me? We do not want to stone you because of any good deeds. 
are because of your blasphemy. You're only a man, but you're trying to make yourself God. <laughs> in your own law that God said you are gods we know that what the scripture says is true forever and God called those people gods the people to whom his message was given as for me the father chose me and sent me into the world how then can you say that I blaspheme because I said that I am the son of God do not believe me then if I am not doing the things my father wants me to do, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, you should at least believe my deeds, in order that you may know, once and for all, that the father is in me, and that I am in the father. Blasphemy! Once more they tried to seize Jesus, but he slipped out of their hands. Jesus then went back again across the Jordan River to the place where John had been baptizing, and he stayed there. Many people came to him. John performed no miracles, they said, but everything he said about this man was true. And many people there believed in him. So Jesus makes some outrageous claims about being God in this chapter. And everybody knows it, so much so that they pick up stones and they want to kill him. And this is a refrain that we see a lot in the book of John. Jesus makes a statement about his divinity. People get upset. Some people follow him. Other people want to kill him. And about every two chapters, he mysteriously disappears, which I think is awesome, and I want to see the videos of that when we get to heaven to see how he did that. Because he did the same thing in the end of chapter 8 when he makes some crazy statements that he existed before Abraham existed, which absolutely made them lose their minds. And so in the midst of this passage, um, I want to remind you that it is the time of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. Now, uh, Hanukkah means dedication. It's the remembrance of... Uh, for a dedication of the altar in the temple. And not just the first dedication. There was this crazy time that happened about 150 years before Jesus. And uh, it was uh, this, this time when the Seleucid uh, Greek Empire came in. And they, the Romans, I believe, took, this is one of their reliefs, took some of the things out of the temple. And then they put a... a they made an altar to Zeus right there in the temple. And they, they come and they throw pig's blood across the temple, desecrating the temple. This is, this is really, really bad news. Uh, the, the guy with the black hat in this whole story is Antiochus Epiphanes. You probably have never heard of him before. But he had six things that he wanted people to do. They are the complete opposite of what God says. You shall profane the Sabbath. You shall profane the festivals and the holy days. You shall set up idols. You shall eat unclean animals. You shall not circumcise your sons, and you shall forget the Torah. Bad news. This guy, big black hat, bad guy. Temple is totally defiled. Enter the hero, Judah Maccabee, who leads this small band of guerrilla warfare guys, Jewish guys, and they, in a very improbable way, defeat this big, clunky, Seleucid army, and they get the temple back. And so they're rededicating the temple, and along the way, they only have, he, Judah only has enough oil for one night. And yet the Lord extends that oil and causes it to burn for eight nights until he's able to get more oil for the lamps in the temple. And so that's what Hanukkah is all about. You can see the eight nights. It's an eight-night celebration, even now, for Jews. And so that was what it harkened back to. Why am I telling you about Hanukkah? Well, Hanukkah was a time when 
everyone was thinking about leaders and leadership and good leadership and bad leadership. Good shepherds and bad shepherds. Some of the readings in the synagogues that week that Jesus is, is actually talking about this were about, was, was from Ezekiel 34 about Israel's false shepherds and how they wouldn't, they wouldn't take care of the sheep and, and they would actually take advantage of the sheep. And yet God said, no, I'm going to come and I'm going to bind up your wounds and I'm going to care for you. And so this is what's being talked about during this time when Jesus makes these statements in John 10. So the principal theme of Hanukkah was really identifying the true shepherd of God's people. Enter Jesus, who says, I tell you the truth. This is, uh, for those of us who uh, read King James and New American Standard for years, this is truly, truly, verily, verily. This is like, you should pay attention, because I'm about to say something really important when I say truly, truly. Uh, NIV just does, I tell you the truth. So whenever you see I tell you the truth, you just need to know, okay, it's time to underline whatever the next statement is. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. There's some folks that are leaders but that aren't very good and they don't have very good intentions. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. Jesus' audience is totally familiar with sheep and shepherds. This is not a a foreign thing. You may not be that familiar. You may not spend that much time with sheep and understand um, how they they operate uh, or how they don't operate. But in the Old Testament, God is clearly the shepherd of Israel. Um, One of my favorite passages that talks about this, there's many, uh, is Isaiah 40, verse 11. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and he carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This shepherd is not just a great protector. He's super compassionate and nurturing. This is the God of his people and, and his role is to shepherd his people. The metaphor is also extended to spiritual leaders and those who have practical leadership. Moses and David were both physical shepherds. We can throw Patrick in there because I always like to put him in the conversation. Shepherds of animals and then later were shepherds of people. They were good shepherds. I would say that David was the, the, uh, the gold standard for all kings were compared to David. And Moses was the one who brought the law. These are the, these are the two like, you don't get bigger than these guys. They are the good shepherds. The bad kings in the Old Testament, conversely, were called false shepherds. We see that in 1 and 2 Kings. So here we are in verses 1 through 3. Jesus is taking advantage of the fact that everybody's thinking about leadership. And in this case, shepherding is the analogy. And in this conversation with Hanukkah going on, Jesus is stressing the importance of discernment on which leaders you follow. And it's still true today. You've got to ask hard questions of spiritual leaders especially. Look at the fruit of their ministry. Study and make sure that what you're being taught is accurate. It goes for me as well. So, the Middle Eastern shepherd would gather his sheep up at night and put them in a pen sometimes just against some kind of bluff or or something where you could build an enclosure and only have one way in and out. Why? Because there's one shepherd to take care of that one way in and out. Shepherd of the sheep, Jesus, in this case, has authority given by the watchman, who I believe is the father, to enter into the sheep pen, to have access and to care for the sheep. And he calls the sheep by name and leads them out. Notice he's not driving them out, kicking them in the butt. He knows them by name, and he leads them out. The Middle Eastern shepherd would sing to their sheep. They would play this little flute, and away their flock would follow the sound of that flute that was different than others. There was a relationship here. Uh, Oftentimes you think about sheep as like, well, they're utilitarian, they're mutton, or they're making sweaters. Um, but we're not going to name them because you don't name animals. Anybody who has animals knows you don't name animals you're going to eat. But in this case, the shepherd has a relationship with the sheep, and he knows that this is Manny, Moe, and Jack, or whatever their names are, and he calls them by name. 
There is an intimacy here between the shepherd and the sheep, which we might not understand, but do you have a dog at home? You probably named your dog. I mean, it might have like a normal name like Spot or something like that. But my guess is if you're like me, I have a very intimate relationship with my two furry little sheep at home. And I don't know that I would lay my life down for them. But I sure spend a lot of money in vet bills. And I buy their food. And I take great pains to make sure they don't run in the street so they get killed. There is this beautiful picture with the shepherd and his sheep. And it's lost on us. But if you can think about your dog that you love so much, we might get kind of close. And in the same way, he knows you. He knows your name. He wants to lead you. You're not unknown to him. Your, your situation is not a surprise. He's not sitting around really disappointed this morning like, oh, well, he finally got to church. Good for him. That's not Jesus' posture toward you. Regardless of how bad you've messed up in the last week or even the last hour, for that sake. Jesus is crazy about you. And your behavior doesn't make him less or more crazy about you. We don't understand unconditional love. It just does not make sense to us. But it keeps on rolling like the waves of grace over our life. And he's a shepherd that knows your name. He wants to lead you. I wonder if there's a place that looks kind of scary that Jesus wants to lead you that you haven't been willing to follow him. Has he been asking you to step away from an unhealthy relationship or been prodding you to go back to school or get back to an interest that you abandoned years ago? Is he inviting you to a new job, a new risk, or a new adventure? Has Jesus been asking you to go without something you love that has become an addiction in your life? Is, is Jesus trying to get you to, to a quiet place where he can just try to get you still long enough so that you can hear what he has to say? As we were watching the video, I felt like the Lord showed me three more things, just kind of modeling this whole idea of listening to his voice. I feel like there's somebody here who's putting off a meeting with somebody because you're afraid. You've been putting off this meeting, and you know it's because you're afraid that it won't go well, but I believe that the Lord's saying, it's time. You need to obey me and do it. I think there's also someone here um, that um, the Lord is asking you to move physically to another place, and you're stubborn, stubbornly refusing to go as much as I hate to see people move away from this place, if the Lord is calling you to do it, and you need to be clear if it's the Lord, then I think you need to go. I also believe that uh, there's somebody here with an alcohol issue, and God's calling you to start dealing with it and share it with someone else because you've been hiding it. I don't say those things to shame you. I don't say those things to... There's no guilt. And I don't know anyone who's necessarily in these categories. I just felt like as I sat over there, that's what the Lord was saying. So we, let's just take a minute and ask the Lord, Lord, is there somewhere where I've been unwilling to follow you because it looks too scary? Let's just take a minute. Let the Lord, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. So this leader God who wants to lead you out and bring you to a, a place, actually, that's a, a safe place, a nurtured place, a place where there's plenty of food, plenty of water. Uh, you read Psalm 23, and you're going to understand the shepherd heart of God for you. But when he's brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So, the sheep of Jesus' flock know his voice. What is it like to hear the voice of Jesus? I've told this story before, so I'll tell the micro mini version. That I was a senior in high school. I was in Arcata, California. Uh, we were doing a cross-country meet the next day, and I was with my teammates. And I hear a, a yelling behind me, and one of my teammates is up against the wall, and this drunk guy is, has him up, and he's threatening him. 
So I go back to try to bring, bring peace to the situation, and this drunk guy drops my friend and punches me in the face. I uh, am embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I feel like my man card has been taken away, and I don't know what to do. And if you've ever been punched in the face, you know that you, there is a rage to uh, the situation where you don't really, or you're not really thinking very well. Um, but in that moment, I, it was one of the times I heard the audible voice of Jesus say this, turn the other cheek. And it was like, whoa, where did that voice come from? It snapped me out of that rage, and I turned around and walked away from the situation. I think there were two huge angels holding him back as he's cussing at me and saying bad things at me, but fortunately not coming and hitting me in the back of the head. I tell you that story because I knew it was Jesus. Why? Because where else have you heard those words? In the Bible. And who says it? Jesus, right? So as we're learning to hear God's voice, there's a couple things that I think maybe are important for you to know. One is you can be pretty sure if it's Jesus that you're hearing God's, if it's words that are actually found in the Bible. Let it make you feel smart. Uh, you can be pretty sure it's Jesus speaking to you if it doesn't contradict anything in the Bible. It's got to line up with everything in God's revealed word. You can be pretty sure it's Jesus talking to you if, if it's challenging you to love God more and love others more. I saw this quote this week. The still small voice of God never calls on me to be like another man. It appeals to me to rise to my full stature and fulfill the promise that sleeps within my being. God is constantly calling out to us to draw us out and to see us walk in our destiny to do the things that he's called us to do. And this still, small voice of Jesus is often quick and like a quick fleeting thought that runs across your mind. And if you're not really paying attention, it just can fly right by. And sometimes the best way to find out if the Lord was introducing an idea to you is to go do it. And to see what the fruit looks like. Because sometimes I'm shocked that I go, well, that just thought that just came into my mind. That might be the Lord. I'm going to just act on it. Now, obviously, it's something that lines up with Scripture, that's leading me to do something, that probably is loving someone better. I'm sacrificing. I'm loving God. It's probably the Lord. And then all of a sudden, I see exponential fruit, and I go, oh, that was the Lord. I didn't know exactly if it was or not, but now I know because I can see the fruit. Only God could do this. That is the kind of life to the fullest we want to li live where we're constantly listening for the voice of God, and those things that whoop, fly into our mind, we think, that might be God. I'm going to do that. And then all of a sudden we see the fruit that's born in our life. That gives incredibly, incredible satisfaction, significance, and purpose to your life. That's why I get up in the morning, because I go, God, what are we going to do today? Man, this is going to be an adventure. I can't wait to see what you have for somebody around me. That's the that's the life that God is inviting you into. And in a world with noise, you've got to choose to hear the still, small voice of God. So, I want to just land in a place where we ask the Good Shepherd a few questions this morning. Because I believe he wants to speak to you and lead you. Even if you've been unwilling to go on a scary path, the good shepherd wants to lead you. He wants to lead you beside quiet waters. He wants to restore your soul. So where is it that Jesus wants to lead you? I asked you to quiet your hearts a few minutes ago to ask where you're afraid to go. But I want to ask you another question. What false shepherds have you been following and listening to that really don't care about you, but you're looking to them for guidance or wisdom, advice, instead of Jesus? It could be as simple as asking Google instead of asking Jesus. And I think that we bow at the altar of information, thinking it's going to transform us. All the while, what we need is a revelation from God and a download from him, and to hear his voice. And so would you stand with me? I just want to pray for us that we would step into a place of obedience 
we'd step into a place of strength and power because of the Holy Spirit working in us and a new sensitivity to his spirit. He's calling to you today. Jesus is calling you today to listen to what he has to say because he's got amazing things to share with you. Some of you are listening to my voice right now and thinking, I can't hear God. That, that's for like super Christians. They got like, a, like an S on their, on their chest somehow when you pull back their shirt, and, and it's just not true. God's always speaking. He wants to teach you. If you're willing to just humble yourself and ask, so God, I pray that you would impart a fresh ability, a new ability to be able to hear your voice, a new strength and power because of the Holy Spirit to come into obedience with your, what your voice says and to follow you. Jesus, you are the good shepherd. You are a good leader, and we want to follow you into the next days of our life. And so help us, help us to hear your voice and help us to step into surrender and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, prayer team, if you'd come up, uh, we would love to pray for you this morning. Um, and um, we're not in a hurry. So you want to stick around, get prayer, great. You want to go get a cup of coffee and, and a visit, great. Um, but I'm really glad you're here, and we'll see you next week.